The U.S. warns Syria that the use of chemical weapons would cross a red line and result in action. But what kind of action? And how credible are the anonymous reports of Syria's WMD anyway? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. I'm Shihab Rutansi. On Wednesday, the U.S. media reported that Syria's government had loaded precursor chemicals for sarin nerve gas into bombs to target the opposition. U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta expressed his concern, and Hillary Clinton promised, quote, action should such weapons be used, though both refused to say exactly how the U.S. would respond. Syrian government officials have emphatically denied the reports, arguing they are designed to provide a pretext for full-scale military intervention. Amidst the reports of WMD, NATO moved forward with its plan to place Patriot missiles and troops along Turkey's border with Syria. Also this week, anonymous U.S. officials conceded to the New York Times that arms shipments approved by Washington to Libyan rebels from the Qatari government had been delivered to anti-American fighters. It was a reminder of the potential for blowback should the U.S. decide on more robust involvement in the Syrian conflict. On Thursday, a reporter from the Associated Press queried the State Department on its criteria and logic as it considers further intervention. Can you ask the big thinkers in this building <laughs> why it is that uh, the use of chemical weapons and the, albeit horrific deaths that would ensue in, in injuries, why that is a red line when you've been not willing to intervene or do anything um, over the past two years when almost 40,000 people have been killed by conventional means? Again, um, you know, I, I, I argue with the, the premise of your question that we've somehow done nothing. Uh, I didn't say nothing. I didn't say you've done nothing. I said working, you have not intervened. Okay. We have been working with the international <coughs> community uh, and leading efforts uh, to put pressure on the Assad regime to have uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad step aside to allow for political transition to take place. Uh, we're just very clear that, uh, given the horrific nature of these que these weapons, this would constitute uh, a red line. Okay. I don't know how to put it any but more. Death of forty thousand people isn't horrific enough. It is horrific, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're not trying to. Well, I guess uh, the question discount. is: Does it matter? Do, 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 you 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 think that it matters the method in which the, or how these people die? Is that correct? Again. Uh, you know, the international community, not just the United States, well, feels strongly that the <clears throat> use of these weapons of mass destruction right. uh, is untenable. Okay. But the death of 40, almost 40,000 people through conventional means is, you know, that, 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 that's not nothing. And, and that's, and and you're absolutely right, Matt. It is, and it is already <coughs> a horrific, ho horrific scene. And because uh, of the Syrian government's uh, uh, seeming uh, nonchalance about uh, killing 40,000 of its own citizens, that's precisely why we're concerned that with its back against the wall, it could take the next step. So what's driving U.S. policy towards Syria? To discuss this, I'm joined by Hillary Mann Leverett, the former White House and State Department official, Steve Clemens, editor-at-large for The Atlantic magazine, and from New York, Tony Caron, a senior editor at Time magazine. Steve Clemens, you speak with many within the administration quite frequently. What are, you, what are you hearing? What are the parameters of the discussion? How has the discussion changed over the last few months? Well, I think the, the most interesting thing to me about the, that what has changed is before, um, just as we heard Mark Toner saying, they believe they've been taking steps, largely diplomatic steps, but let's just say it, they're soft steps because there's been no policy answer, policy solution uh, to really address the, the horrors going on inside Syria. What's changed is now a discussion of how, what was Obama's criteria for justifying the intervention in Libya. And there were four or five criteria that were very important for him. One was being on the edge of an atrocity. So you have sort of an atrocity-driven action, if you will, uh, uh, or attention. In, in Libya's case, it was Benghazi. In this case, it may be uh, the after-the-fact or on-the-fact use of chemical weapons. And, but you also had to have a regional commitment 
uh, regional support for the move, and then essentially UN approval uh, for the move. And these were all part of a very well-defined set of criteria that the President's National Security Advisor actually gave to me personally and said, this is how we made our decision. You're beginning to hear more of that discussion about are all these boxes being checked off? Uh, because we really don't know where the administration will go, but that's the, that's the chatter at the moment. Well, I mean, there's been a great deal of chatter, Hillary, this, mm -hmm. this week then about weapons of mass destruction specifically. What are we to make of this idea that, that, that something is going on with the arsenal? Well, I think we should really ask some serious questions about it. We've been down this road before. We went the, down this road in invading Iraq on the basis of so-called evidence, which was really manufactured, that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction that he didn't have. We went in to disarm him of weapons he didn't have. And here, nobody is asking the basic question, how do we know that chemical weapons are being mixed, removed, or done all sorts of things that could be used in, in a way against their own people? We honestly probably have no way of knowing. This is not something you can get at by flying a drone over these four to bunkers or having your satellite take pictures over a fortified bunker. These are things that go on inside a fortified bunker. By definition, you need to have human intelligence to tell you what's going on. And since we closed our embassy and left Syria, we have very little ability to get that human intelligence. There is a really serious question about whether this so-called evidence of them moving chemical weapons and preparing them, whether that has any basis in fact whatsoever. But nonetheless, people in the administration are leaking this information. So what's going yes. on? Yes. So you have to ask why would they do that? I think there are two basic, three basic reasons. One is to get leverage over Russia and China and potentially Iran so that they will not have, be as opposed to a plan to push Assad out or collapse the Assad government. The second is potentially to create a pretext, whether it's by uh, President Obama or others within the administration or our so-called allies, to take more militaristic, overtly militaristic action to intervene um, in Syria. And the third is to scare Assad and his loyalists, that the you know, military intervention is imminent, and so you better get out of, out of town fast. Tony Caron, is, is, is it clear what action means when Hillary Clinton or Leon Panetta says that? Is it simply to secure weapons of mass destruction? We're seeing reports that would take 75,000 troops to do that. Is it, um, is it to, you know, for regime change? What, 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 what do you think they're talking about exactly? Yeah, I think this is very confused and it speaks to a policy that, that is not quite clear. And clearly, at the moment, they're facing a situation where there is a sense that the policy options that they've developed up to now are being outstripped by events. I'm not so sure that the primary concern over the uh, chemical weapons in Syria is so much that Assad might use them as much as, or perhaps more immediately, that he might lose them. That essentially there's some concern that the Syrian state essentially is breaking up. We, what we're seeing now is a contraction of the scope of what the regime controls. The re it's being forced to give up on, on f outlying outposts. Rebels are able to overrun military bases in outlying areas. The regime still holds the population center. So there's a sense that you know, the Syrian state and the regime's control of it are, are, are cracking up. And I think there's a real fear that what we're seeing here is, is the potential for a very, very nasty situation to to uh, to develop in which there's no simple military solution to to anything you know I don't think there's a case of you know anybody's talking about putting uh, US troops on the ground um, I suspect that that one that 75,000 troop number for securing uh, weapons of mass destruction sites might have been uh, partly an attempt by some in the military to uh, remind the policymakers of the scale of the commitment of, of ground troops, in other words, to put them off from that option. I think uh, it's a situation where they're looking at managing uh, the crisis and, and managing the landing of the regime, whose fall now seems, or who's, who's who be, being knocked out of central power now seems more and more, more likely. With all due respect to, to Tony, whose analysis I, I greatly admire, I think it doesn't really put enough of a critical lens on what's going on. It's not a real fear that Syria is going to give chemical weapons or somehow they're going to lose them to Hezbollah. That's what's being played up to play to people's concerns that are unfounded, that even if Hezbollah got hold of these, these, these chemical weapons, which are not candy that can just be handed off or a loss down the drain, that Hezbollah would then use them against our ally Israel. That's what, that's what they're playing to here in Washington among the foreign but policy elite. But that's not are a real about all the opposition, fear. frankly, who they're worried about. They're worried about the Salafi, uh, you know, jihadis who are fighting against Assad. Isn't that? 
perhaps their main concern. Well, then that would be a different change than what, what Steve, I think, so articulately laid out is the, what the administration is saying their concern is. And that would be what I would call the Benghazi effect. Right. Is the regime, now, is the government here now taking more seriously the Benghazi effect that when you arm, train, and fund jihadists, either directly or indirectly, like we did in Afghanistan, Libya, and now in Syria, that you actually could pay a consequence as serious as 9 11? Because that's what we have in our history. And the, the assassination potentially well, of Ambassador right, Stevens. Right, the blowback, the blowback that can come back and that there's a real mix. And I would just, just add one other thing, that, that, that part of the premise here, and I think we have to be very careful, I think, I think what uh, Hillary laid out in her analysis is, is exactly right with one exception, that the notion of pretext, while that may be some of the ambition of some people in the U.S. government, there's a real aversion to the notion of deploying troops, because we haven't. They, they could have used many excuses previously to intervene, to bomb, to step. They have not wanted to fall into that slippery slope, and they've tried to stay away. So we need to realize that the president has an allergy to this. He wants to extract himself from the Middle East, not be drawn back in. And what is happening is either through leak or other issues or something that may be tangible and real. We don't know yet. That's why I don't believe until uh, gassing of people actually happens, I don't think you're going to see that, a response from the United but States. But that's what's so similar yeah. and disturbing about the parallel to Iraq and what that's happened right. in the play out. Because what you're talking about, I think, <laughs> parallels the situation that, that then Secretary of State Colin Powell was in. That's a right. real aversion to getting sucked into an invasion of Iraq. Similarly, I do think there are people in the Obama administration who have an aversion to doing that too. But that's what's so neat and convenient about the chemical weapons mm -hmm. story, is that you can bring in people who have that aversion, who don't want a pretext, but who want to put leverage pressure on China, Russia, and Iran. You can also use this as leverage or pressure against Assad himself and his loyalists to see that intervention is coming, they better get out of town. Well, look, so it's the convenient lowest common denominator. Well, we did have this other leak then this week in the New York Times uh, about uh, what happened in Libya. Um, uh, and it's very interesting, and I want to get your thoughts on that. This is a quote, or well, these are some quotes from that article that appeared in the NYT. Uh, in the months before the Benghazi attack, the Obama administration clearly was worried about the consequences of its hidden hand helping arm Libyan militants. It, meaning Qatar's li hidden hand. Um, concerns that have not previously been reported. The weapons and money from Qatar strengthened militant groups in Libya, allowing them to become a destabilizing force since the fall of the Gaddafi government. Former administration officials said the U.S. has growing concerns, just as in Libya, the Qataris are equipping some of the wrong militants now in Syria as well. I mean, what did you make, well, first, why, why was this leaked now, do you think, Hillary? I think it's very interesting and has a lot to do with the congressional investigations over what's going on in Benghazi and the likelihood that we will have increased in-depth congressional investigations come January. This, is, this story was reported particularly by journalists and the lead journalist here whose job is 24-7 to cover the CIA. He doesn't cover the White House, he doesn't cover politicians, he covers the CIA. So what I think you have here is a leak coming from within the intelligence agencies that are concerned with increased congressional scrutiny. We may find out that the very people who killed Ambassador Stevens did so with arming, training, and funding indirectly from, from the United States, exactly, indirectly from the United States, just as we did in Afghanistan, just as we did, as we're doing now in Syria, that this happened in Libya, that whether it's the Qataris and our Emir Emiratis, the Saudis or somebody else, that the U.S. authorized it, the White House, not the CIA, the White House authorized it, so it's not the CIA's uh, blame and the gutteries did it, so it's not something that we really got our hands dirty before. Right, and of course, and but this it's has this narrative to, to drive who really is to blame for a disastrous policy. But clearly, Tony, this has implications then for Syrian policy and about whether to arm arm the opposition. Do, do you feel that this is giving that the administration pause, or is there a sense that in order to gain some influence, at least amongst the opposition, no matter the disaster, any potential disastrous consequences, you know, they have to be involved with arming the opposition? Well, I think, you know, it's a, clam it's a clumsy policy because uh, one's dealing with a situation where a lot of the fighting, particularly in northern Syria, is being done by Salafist militias, particularly Jabhat al-Nusra, the group that now is reportedly being going to be put on the U.S. list of international terrorist organizations. And that seems related to, to what we were talking about earlier of the, the Benghazi uh, Qatar link, which seems to be fire, you know, w sending out a warning against uh, U.S. allies arming groups like uh, J Jabhat al-Nusra. The, the problem, of course, is that those, you know, the U.S. policy might be like, well, maybe we can uh, isolate and limit the influence of Salafist and, and more radical groups among the insurgents fighting the Syrian regime. But you have to figure, well, these guys are playing a leading role on the ground in combat. How will other uh, militias that the U.S. is trying to cultivate look upon the U.S. You know, declaring these guys off limits who are actually shouldering a lot of the fighting 
um, in the eyes of Syrian fighters who, who don't see very much you know, direct combat help coming from the U.S. So I think that uh, you know, that on the one hand, and on the other hand, the attempt to graft a political leadership that was created in Doha a couple of weeks ago, the national coalition, onto this collection of militias that's fighting the regime, which you know, looks like a long shot right now. It's an the idea that they're the sole legitimate voice of the Syrian people is an aspiration of, of the backers of this group more than it is a reality on the ground. So I think you know, they're, they're coming very late to, to a policy of trying to micromanage to the extent that it's possible, something that may be way beyond um, Washington's ability to influence. But in the meantime, Steve, does the administration think it's acceptable for the Qataris and others to be arming anti-American Salafists in Syria? No, I think there's a lot of discomfort, um, but, but I think at the same time, you know, what's interesting about what Tony just said, and it's so important, is that there is a kind of Cold War era fashion confidence that America can get in and designate who the winners and losers, who the good guys and bad guys are in a revolution. Uh, and we used to do that a lot in the Cold War. And it was easier when there was the Soviet Union over there to point to and that you were able to do this. But it's a, it's a hubris that really undermines what we're doing. I think that uh, when it comes to the, what the Qataris and, and UAE are doing, there has been a relationship where we have blocked and prevented them from moving heavy weapons. And there seems to be a growing tilt to allow them to do more and more. We were just been reading about the surface-to-air missiles that have begun to make their way into Syria. Uh, and there's a concern that some of that are going to some of the Islamist brigades that Tony just discussed. That then creates a lot of problems if you were to think about a no-fly zone. So, so there's been an uncomfortable relationship, partly cooperative and partly conflictual, because essentially the people that we just, you know, that Hillary just talked about in Libya, uh, and and the way the Qataris see it, those is so-called Islamist brigades are the, their cousins. When you look at what Gaddafi had in his government with with the LIFG that was fighting him, and he was arresting these jihadists going over to fight us in Iraq. Those were people who were part of the milieu, the families, the networks uh, of these areas. So it's, it's always been strange to me that, that the United States would think that it could control well, the families and networks. Yeah. But who does think that? Yeah. And how split is the administration, do you think, Hillary? And, and what bearing might any of the upcoming cabinet appointments have on this discussion? State, mm. defense, and CIA? Yes. Well, well you know, I think there's, there, there may be on the surface some, some, some split and division. I'll get to that in, in just a second. But I think overall, I, I take Steve's point and I would broaden a bit. I think there's something deeply cultural, something deep in American strategic culture that believes that no matter who we arm, train, and fund, as long as they knock off the political order that we don't like that is defying the United States, mm -hmm. that somehow organically the population will rise up and construct a liberal, secular political order. Notwithstanding the fact that the fighters are, are jihadists, they will construct a liberal, secular political order. We have this delusion time and time again, and I think it's something very deeply embedded in American strategic culture. In terms of how that would play out, who is in tar charge of the State Department, the Defense Department, the CIA, I think you know people like, um, like Susan Rice are, I think, They've gone far down this road, in my, in, my, in my humble opinion, of delusion. That if you just get rid of bad political order, that will solve humanitarian problems, and a liberal, secular, uh, do-good order will, will be put in place. Yeah, That's but, what we but could But if we you ended up, today. alternatively, there, that, you know, who you have does matter. If you had a mm -hmm. Chuck Hagel, if you had a, right, you know, to different. some degree, a John Kerry, you're going to have more of a strategic mind, That's someone right. that's more uh, of a realistic assessor and someone who avoids sentiment uh, in a lot of these but decisions. But perhaps realizing so. that you can't actually <laughs> ally with and, Gulf states who uh, don't want a secular. Well, and that gets yes. into something that's, that's <laughs> evolved and developed in, in, in Washington's political elite and culture now for the past few years, which wasn't really as much of a factor 10 years ago, which is now, you know, we used to have the pro-Israel lobby. Now we have a tremendous amount of money coming from the Gulf, where it is increasingly difficult to question what some of, um, some of our friends are doing in the Gulf. Tony, you wanted to come in. Uh, y yes, I, I think, uh, apropos what, what Hillary was saying, this is very important, that uh, the, on the one hand, the U.S. look, you know, there's this narcissistic look, you know, mm. uh, search for people like us, people who will echo, the, you know, a U.S. worldview. But we have to recognize that the reason that the Gulf states are arming uh, these groups in, in, in various Arab rebellions is not a desire to see Jeffersonian democracy take root in the Arab world. It's very much about a sectarian based split and division of the Middle East. Um, on, on sectarian lines in order to basically challenge Iranian influence and the perceived sort of Cold War between Iran and its adversaries in, in the region. And to the extent that that becomes a prism for, or has been a prism to some extent for decision making or the way in which 
some people in Washington have actually viewed the Syrian conflict, that becomes very difficult to, to, to manage the outcome because precisely uh, the pushing back, the, the jihadist Salafis are actually the, the, at the forefront of challenging Iranian influence on the ground in a number of places, but yet they also represent a problem and a challenge to, to other Western interests at the same time. And that's a dilemma that's never really been, been sort of publicly grappled with. But that does bring up, I mean, we keep on hearing this term red line. All this week, and we, and we saw Matt Lee of Associated Press remind there. you of Netanyahu with that big right. bomb. Well, exactly. <laughs> uh, but he, when he, uh, clearly, as Matt Lee was questioning the State Department spokesman there, um, these red lines have nothing to do with humanitarian concerns, but are about U.S. strategic no. interests. So the question is then, what is the what, U.S. strategic what, interest? In but what case? Mark Toner said, and what what he couldn't say, is that the methodology of killing matters. Mm -hmm. That yes, there are forty thousand dead people in Syria, and that's not a red line. What is a red line is the methodology of killing. Right. This this administration, with chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons, has believed that it has tried to restore a commons, a global commons, and commitment to limiting those that the Bush administration, that people like John Bolton, greatly eroded. And so, for the administration, it's a defining challenge. So the use of these weapons is looked at in a different way. It's not the number of people who so, die. So the methodology it's a, it's a does matter, and that's. The realistic thing about, about the example for the rest of the world, do you think that's the strategic interest I think it's governing decision-making? I yeah. think it's much more crass, and I think you know, Steve's allusion to, to Netanyahu in Israel, it's a pretty similar parallel, that both for the Israelis trying to stare down the Iranians and losing, and the United States trying to stare down two-bit Bashar al-Assad and losing, you have to constantly redraw where the red line is to make up for the fact that you have not ousted these people from power. You have that's not right. affected regime change. The fact for the, administra the Obama administration is they have a problem. Over 20 months ago, they said Bashar al-Assad has to go, and he's not gone. So they have to keep moving the red line. So when you ask about chemical weapons, where is the red line for it, you get into this ridiculous uh, to and fro in terms of how many people are killed, whether that matters, how they're killed. And you also get into a ridiculous debate about, well, is he ha does he have the <coughs> chemicals mixed? Have they put them in the right canisters or not? Right. I mean, who even knows whether this is based on science? It's all about, I think, the problem that both the United States and Israel have, that they cannot face down these political orders that they don't like. Tony, do you think that's it then? It'll simply come down to not losing face with Iran and China and Russia as opposed to any other perhaps more rational strategic... I mean, maybe that is a rational geopolitical well, uh, uh, concern. I don't know. But, I mean, is that going to be it, though? No, but I think that the, that the, the, the whole uh, chemical weapons thing might actually prove to be not exactly a red herring. I mean, I think it's a real concern, but I think at the same time, it's not really uh, necessarily the only discussion that, need, that, that Washington will need to, to have and the only decisions it'll have to make. Because if, there, if, we're, you know, if we assume for, for a minute that Assad did have chemical weapons and that he, they were his trump card, you know, his final moment, that, that he would play in his final moment to try and, and hang on to something, we have to think, well, is this the, the trump card moment? Is this the moment in which he plays his trump card in Damascus where, you know, he stands to lose everything? Or do the, the Alawite kind of security core that are the basis of his regime actually retreat to something more defensible, in which case playing the, the, the decisive but trump card, if the, that was the case, doesn't really but make what about beyond sense. the WMD, though, Tony? The, the fact is the longer this goes on, the, the, the less face the U.S. has as regards Iran and Russia and China, is that maybe going to be the, the Sure, the but I mean, I think that the, the U.S. has lost face in terms of being able to uh, dictate outcomes through the projection of military force in the Middle East, right. starting with the invasion of Iraq. I don't think that's a retrievable uh, goal. I don't think that there's any military th action that can be taken that can really reverse that sense that the U.S. is no longer able, or nobody else is able actually either, for, through, mi through the military force but to basically remake the Middle East. What's really, what we're discussing here is something very important because what we're all, I think, acknowledging is that Syria is a platform on which there are other superpower right. Uh, mm -hmm. war is going on. Beneath that, there are genuine uh, folks fighting uh, it, it, it for their country, to have whether these Islamic discussions jihadists. In some ways, you know. And so there are two different levels. And right. that's why I find the absurdity of the United States thinking it can you know, decide who you know, the white hat and black hat uh, players are in inside Syria because fundamentally it's a competition. So with is Iran. there no there's reason, competition there's, with Russia? Reason, there's a reason why yeah. we have to do it, and there's a reason why, even though, as both Tony and Steve alluded to, the ability for the United States to affect outcomes with the projection of conventional force has gone down precipitously and probably is not recoverable. That's but right. we hold on to it desperately because we have no soft power argument to give to Arabs, to give to Muslims on why we should be in their countries, in their society. But is there no chance for some rational diplomacy of the sort that many have 
Cold War for years in Afghanistan and elsewhere, involving Iran, involving China, involving well, Russia. Well, that would be conflict resolution, and that would require dealing with yeah. the Assad government, dealing with Bashar al-Assad, and not only not having preconditions for the talks, but getting rid of this idea that we can have pre-results. That would be real conflict resolution, and we are steadfastly opposed to that. But what about Lakhda Brahimi, by the way? I mean, a few months ago, you were saying he was a great hope. It doesn't look like things are working out there. I still think he's a great hope. I worked yeah. with him on Afghanistan. I have enormous respect and admiration for him. The great thing about he, Brahimi is he's willing to do a deal with uh, the devil. <laughs> he's willing which to is talk conflict to all but I, that's parties. Conflict Tony, last word. We have 20 seconds. Well, well, yes, I mean, I think that, that you touched on the, uh, the diplomacy issue and that what we, there's a blind spot in the diplomacy until now. The U.S. is talking to Russia, and that's very important. Russia is an important sponsor of the regime. It's, not to, it's always steadfastly refused to have Iran involved in, in any discussion about Syria. That's a mistake, obviously, because Iran clearly has a, right. a, a significant stake here. And it, 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 if things are going to be managed and contained, there will have to be a Tony. conversation with Iran, which Brahimi is doing. Tony Garant, Hilary Mann-Leverett, Steve Clements, thank you all very much. That's Great all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. Thank you.